Good morning. Aren't you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Thank you, Jeff and the praise team, for bringing us into worship through music. And I'm excited about what God is doing in our church. I want to talk to you about tingled ears. You may say that sounds strange, but it's in the Bible four times. And we're going to dig into the book of, I mean, we're going to dig into the priest called Eli. The priest called Eli, he was a Jewish priest during the days of Judges. He's remembered by the blessing upon Samuel's mother and also Samuel's first prophecy. But he's an amazing character. He had two sons that worked in the tabernacle. Now, you may say, well, this is a family business. Well, it did become a family business, but not in a good way. Eli and his two sons was far from what God intended the tabernacle to be and everything. You may say, well, Steve, at least they were in church. Well, that's a problem that we have in this country. That's a problem that we have in this world. There's too many churches that are really not what God intended it to be. So today's about sermon about Eli is where they went astray. They went the totally opposite of what God wanted the tabernacle to be. Eli was responsible for it. His two sons were responsible for it. In other words, they twisted the truth, and they replaced everything that God intended for the tabernacle to be with pleasures of the world. And I kind of see this in our society today. I see churches saying, you know, we want to be a feel-good church. We want to be a church where everybody can come and, you know, God doesn't say anything bad about our behavior. God doesn't say anything bad about our lifestyle. In other words, we see that with churches after churches. And I mentioned a while back, and you can take this however you want to take it. I really don't care. I said, I pray that the churches do not, that do not stand on the Word of God, the churches that do not stand on the Word of God, I pray that they close their doors. Because there's something more important, and that's God's Word, than the church surviving. You know, so I do pray that. I pray it on a regular basis for churches that have turned away from God. And that's what happened during the days of Eli. The church turned away from what God's intent was for them. You know, and it's doing the same thing today. Scripture tells us really how far the tabernacle during the times of Eli has turned away. It says in the Scriptures, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Now, this was the tabernacle. This was supposedly the church. This was where the people went to hear God's word. But the Scripture tells us during the days of Elijah, the word of the Lord was rare. Kind of think about that today, too. Because if you say something that someone doesn't agree with, they bash you. But I'd rather be bashed by man than not accepted by God. I would. You know, even during the Eli's time, he had a daughter. His daughter-in-law had a son named Ichabob. And the name Ichabob means no glory. In other words, the glory has departed from Israel, the mother said. The glory has departed from Israel, Ichabod's mother said. So we can set the scene of what's taking place. The church has turned from what God wanted it to be. And if you want to go and dig deeper, you can find a lot of things that took place in the tabernacle that was not of God and everything. But we can learn a lot from this story. We can learn a lot from this story, and we can prevent it happening to us. Because when you start to veer from the truth a little bit, it's a little bit easier to veer a little bit more until you're off the path. So this morning, I want to share with you some stories about Eli. I want to share with you some stories about how God came in and God intervened. And I'm going to share some stories about how God will give us what we need when we need it. But let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we love you, Lord. And Father, we ask for your blessings upon us as we come to your word and we open it up and we dig deeper. Father, bless us with your word that it may change our lives That may change our direction. Father, may we hold fast to the truths of your word. Bless us, Lord, with your presence. For it's your sweet and heavenly name that we pray. 
Amen. First, the warning sign. As I said before, tingled ears. There's a warning sign. The church was corrupt, and God was sending a warning. In other words, God was saying, hey, Eli, there's a problem, not just in your household. There's a problem in their tabernacle, and I'm sending you a warning. So we take our Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 11. And it says, And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. I thought about this because it's mentioned four times in scriptures of the tingling of the ears. And now what he's saying is this is not a tingle where, oh, that felt so good. It was, if you look at it in the scripture, it means really someone came behind you or right in front of you and they grabbed both hands and they popped you in both ears. In other words, it was a pain. It was something that you did not want to hear. It was something that, you know, went to the core of your soul in a sense and it just rattled you. It's not a good thing to be tingled in your ears by Almighty God. But here, God is saying, I'm sending you a warning. See, God's goal in our life is not to just tingle our ears. God's goal in our life is, as Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. But he's saying, let them hear the truth of God. Let them hear about God. Let them hear who God is. But he's saying, when I tingle your ears, I'm sharing with you that you're on the wrong path. I'm sharing with you that there's something that's up that should not be. You know, we love to hear the stories about what God is doing. We do. We like to hear the stories about God granting favor in our lives. And God is saying he is about to tingle the ears of some people. And here was a, a battle that Israel should have won, but they lost. They lost the battle. And I believe it was 30,000 foot soldiers that they lost in that one battle. But they lost the battle, and God was sending a warning to them that they need to turn around, they need to redirect and refocus their life to God. You know, tingle your ears. But man, we have an awesome God. This is so amazing to me. We have an awesome God. And do you know that God wants to bless you more than He wants to tingle your ears? We find in scriptures, as I said, four times where he tingles the ears. But how many times do we find in scripture where God says, I want to put favor on you. I want to bless you. I want to lift you up. In other words, God is more concerned about blessing us. God is more concerned about putting favor on us than he is tingling our ears. That's an awesome God. That's an awesome God. He says he wants to give us favor more than tingling the ears. And I love Psalms 30, verse 5. For his anger lasts only a moment. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that your anger, the tingling of my ears, will only last for a moment. But we have a God that says, but his favor lasts a lifetime. His favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Man, God is gracious. His characters give us more favor than he gives us tingling of the ears. But he says, you know what? When I tingle the ears, you need to pay attention. You need to listen. You need to apply it. You need to listen very carefully of what I'm about to say. That's what God is saying. He is saying, He wants to correct us in order for us to receive the blessing. He's not going to give you the blessing. He's not going to give you the favor. He's not going to give you really what you want if you're outside of his will. And the Israelites was outside of it. But where did they go wrong? Where did they go wrong? So let's look at the problem revealed because they lost the battle. Why? 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore had the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the shallow unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hands of our enemies. Now, we got to look at this Ark of the Covenant because it's so, so amazing. Because here the Israelites are saying, hey, let's go get the Ark of the Covenant and let's bring it into our presence. 
And they know that even in the book of Joshua, the Ark of the Covenant was instrumental in the battle of Jericho. They said, man, God showed up. God showed out because we had the Ark of the Covenant. They knew that the Ark of the Covenant was God's presence. And they also know that the Ark of the Covenant in the book of Joshua, it provided the Israelites safe passage over the Jordan to the promised land. So what could go wrong? We have the Ark of the Covenant. What could go wrong? We have witnessed where God showed up. We witnessed where God showed out. What can go wrong? Just because you're in church doesn't mean you have the protection and strength of the Almighty God just because you're here worshiping today. It doesn't mean you're going to have the strength and the protection of the Almighty God. But there's a problem here. And the problem is in the scripture that I just read. So let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 3. I want to show you where the problem arises. Why they lost the battle. And when the people were coming to the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore had the Lord smitten us today before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord. Out of shallow unto us. Listen to this. When it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. They had a problem. They substituted the he, the almighty God, with an it. They substituted the power and the authority of God with an object. That was their problem. That was the problem. See, the it was the Ark of the Covenant. The he is the mighty God of the Bible. The it represents his presence, but the he is his presence. That's where they went wrong. May it save us. See, the it is the object. The he is the subject. I don't have anything against anybody wearing crucifixion or crosses. I think they're great. I think they're great if you want to wear them. I think it represents your faith in God. But the cross around your neck has no power. It has no authority. It's an object. And if you grab it and you say, Lord, I want this cross to save me, that cross ain't going to save you. It's the belief in the one that was on the cross that saves you. It's that belief. See, there's nothing wrong with wearing a cross. Just make sure that your faith is on the one that was on the cross and not the object of the cross. See, they started to look at the ark as a good luck charm. They said, man, we have a good luck charm. The Philistines come down to battle us. We're going to pull out our good luck charm. And it's the ark of the covenant. You know... Because they said, our good luck charm, surely God is with us because we have the ark. In other words, you may say they became belief in a rabbit foot theology. A rabbit foot theology. Y'all remember those things? Man, everybody had one on a keychain. Everybody had a rabbit foot because it represented good luck. That rabbit foot didn't do anything for you. Not a thing. It didn't. The Ark of the Covenant didn't do anything for the Israelites. It was like they may thought it as a magic lamp. We have the Ark of the Covenant. We have the good luck charm. We have the magic lamp that we can make a wish upon. But man, look at what was taking place. As they was bringing out the ark, a pep rally was about to take place. A preparation of victory was taking place. They were saying, God will have us to win if the ark of the covenant is with us. They focused on the it instead of the he. Think about that for a moment. How many times that we're honest with ourselves, we focus on the it's in life instead of the he in our life. 
We do it a lot. See, the ark's always been a visible symbol of God's presence. But it should never be meant to become a substitute for God himself. And that's what they did. That's why they lost. It was a symbol of his presence. But it became a substitute for him in their lives. I mean, just the name of it, the Ark of the Covenant, it's a reminder of God's relationship with him and his people. The problem, though, they were trusting in the Ark more than they were their God. They were trusting in the Ark more than they were with their God. So let's look at the reaction to the problem. Man, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 5, when the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, and as I said before, the pet rally is starting, it says, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Man, you are thinking you're about to win. The crowd is pumped up. Thousands of men and women and children and everybody is praising God. Or are they praising the ark? Which one is it? It says, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground was shaken. Man, if we look at that, we can say revival was about to take place. The church was on the move. God was about to do something. And God looked down, I believe, and said, your trust is not in me. Your trust is in a symbol. A symbol of my presence but I want more in life than you to trust a symbol. I want you to trust me. Could the church be on fire at that time? Could revival be taking place? The ground shaking, confidence being restored? How can you lose? The Ark of the Covenant was in the camp, but it was misplaced. It was misplaced. With God himself. So we have the Israelites. Man, they was on a pep rally. The Philistines. The Philistines was afraid because they heard the shouting. They heard the opposing force. They heard them praising. They heard them shouting out to God probably. And the Philistines was afraid and they said, A God has come into the camp. We're doomed. We're doomed. But then someone spoke to the Philistines. Because we find in chapter 4, verse 9, Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you'll be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. One side said we can't lose because we have a symbol of God's presence in our life. The other side said, you know what? I think they just have a good luck charm. I think they just have a good luck charm. Because the other side said, be men and fight. But what I find so amazing about this story is both sides believed in that God, God Almighty. Both sides believed in God Almighty. The Philistines believed that this was a God that delivered the Israelites time before, and they said, we're doomed. And the Israelites believed in the God that delivered them before. But they refocused what they should have done. They refocused on a symbol. See, they both believed in God. But they reacted differently. I want to read this to you. I want to make sure you get it because this is very important. How you react. How you react to what God is doing. Our reaction to problems in life will lead us to God or will empower our enemies to defeat us. Think about that. Our reaction to problems in life will lead us to God or will empower our enemies to defeat us. That's what the Israelites did. They empower their enemies to defeat them. I believe we do the same thing. We empower our enemies to defeat us. 
because of our reaction to our problems. Israel lost. The Philistines won. But the life application part of this I find so amazing because God is incredible. He is. Maybe God has tingled your ears. Maybe he is setting you on a different path for your life to be a closer walk with him. But God still wants to give you favor. God wants to give you favor. He may tingle your ears, but now he wants to give you favor because you know the problem. Now you choose your reaction. Victory or defeat. And you know what I said? God wants to bless you and give you favor more than he wants to tingle your ears. God gives us a new occasions to praise. Sometimes we have to look for it. Sometimes we have to ask for it. In Psalms 109, verse 1, it says this. My God, whom I praise... Do not remain silent. God of my praise. The name here is, I hope I get this right, Elohi Tihalati. Elohi Tihalati. And what that means is God of praise, but this is where it gets good. This is where it gets really, really good. It is saying, God, grant me new occasions to praise. Woo! God grant me new occasions to get praise. What we need to do when we leave here, we need to say, God, the rest of the day, grant me a new occasion to give you praise. This mor- Tomorrow morning when you wake up, nobody wants to go to work, but you're going to have to go to work. Your feet's going to hit the ground, and you're going to say, man, it's Monday and it stinks. But you're going to say, you know what? God, give me a new occasion to praise you today. And you need to do it on Tuesday. You need to do it on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And when you come back next Sunday, say, God, today is Sunday. Today is worship. Give me a new occasion to praise. God wants to give us new occasions to praise each and every single day. Give God some praise. This morning... Maybe God has tingled your ears. And when he does, he's going to give you the problem. He's going to lay the problem out that he has with you. And when he lays the problem out, make a choice. And then when you make the choice, say, God, thank you. That each and every day, you'll give me a new occasion to praise you. And he will. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we love you, Lord. Father, we ask for your blessings upon us as we go into the invitation. Speak to us, Lord. Guide us, direct us. And Father, we thank you that each and every day we have a new occasion to praise the almighty God that you are. Father, bless us during this invitation. For it's your sweet and heavenly name that we pray. Amen. Please stand.